It's great to be with you all today. My name is Kevin Bullock. Um, I'm on our strategic partnerships team. And, and I'm guessing Maxar might be a, a new name for this group. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give a quick introduction about who we are and then uh, turn it over to Chris and Jennifer, who are the technical gurus from our, our side. But I, what I will say is, is Maxar, we are a champion of USD format. Uh, as I as I talk to various end users and customers using Maxar data, USD comes up on a daily basis for me. Um, so we know it's popular, we know it's powerful, we want to support it, um, which is one of the main reasons why we're here, but it's, it's also an interesting convergence of what we do, which is space technology, <laughs> and what you all do. With, um, so um, if you, if anyone here uh, consumes any sort of news, um, you've probably seen Maxar uh, uh, data uh, along with, with news articles, um, whether that be, uh, and I've just posted a few here, but we literally have hundreds of these, um, uh, whether it be the recent hurricane that hit Florida, um, the volcano which is still erupting in Hawaii, um, or the conflict that's going on in Ukraine. Um, there's also a cool USA Today um, uh, thing that came out at the end of the year that that used 10 images that told stories from space. And that's kind of what we do. Um, you may also be using our data and not even know it on some of the apps on your smartphone. Um, so we work with uh, 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 companies like Google and Apple, uh, even Snapchat. So my kids all use the Snapchat map. And that's that's the picture there with the on the on the left. But our satellite data comes through as the the imagery layer in those applications. Um, um, and e even when you call an Uber, uh, you know Uber uses our data to optimize routes. And and so we like to think that there are billions of people probably using um, some sort of Maxar derived technology every single day, even though it might not be a a name that that everyone in the world recognizes. So hopefully some of those resonated with you all. Um, if those didn't resonate, um, um, we're working on, as part of NASA's Artemis mission uh, to send uh, the first woman to the moon and, and the next uh, man back to the moon. Um, so we also, in addition to satellite imagery, we also are building robotics um, in, in the form of robotics, robotic arms that go on the, the rovers, in this case, the lunar lander propulsion system. So we do a wide variety of space technology. Uh, this is sort of the core um, asset we'll be talking about today. We we actually manufacture um, satellites in Palo Alto. Uh, we launch them on SpaceX rockets and we uh, operate them on a daily basis. We're sending commands to them every single day to take pictures of the earth. So we're sort of doing cinematography from from space, I'm sure you all would love to get more specifics on the these these cameras. It's it's sort of like the Hubble telescope, but it's pointed at Earth, not into deep space. Um, so these these satellites have apertures over a meter wide. Um, they're capable of collecting a ton of data. Um, we we uh, measure everything in square kilometers, um, but you know every single day we're collecting about 3.8 million square kilometers to give you a reference state of california is like 450,000 square kilometers <laughs> i think texas is around 700,000 square kilometers so the equivalent of like five plus texas's per day now that's spread out all over the world um so we're we're operating in these sun synchronous orbits so that while we're asleep here in in uh the united states if you're located in the united states um, our, our satellites are on the sunny side of the world, collecting data on that side of the world. So we literally cover um, the entire world um, with satellite data. And one thing we talk about is resolution. Um, and this is uh, the way we met, quantify this is sort of a pixel size. So from space, um, we are collecting uh, 30 centimeter pixels, which then we can enhance to 15 centimeter pixels, which means one pixel in an image represents a um, 15 centimeter by 15 centimeter square on Earth. Um, 
there are lots of Earth imaging satellites out there. Um, in fact, the, the US operates the Landsat constellation, which is a public domain data set, but it's like a 10 meter resolution satellite. So it's very low resolution compared to what we're talking about here. Um, in fact, we only go to two meter in our example here. But with, with these high resolution satellites, we can literally see and resolve paint lines on the road from, from space. Um, so to put that in into action, um, I'm I'm guessing this spaceship might look familiar to to a few of you. Um, we thought this was pretty meta because we're we're using our spacecraft, our literal spacecraft, to take pictures of a fictional spacecraft in Disneyland, known as the Millennium Falcon. Um, and what's interesting here is is you'll see these little. Um, I'm trying to use my mouse, but that probably won't work. These are people you can see um, in in Star Wars land. So we can see it's not that we can see people's faces, but one person kind of takes up a few pixels uh, in our imagery. So that gives you a sense of uh, sort of the the quality. Now, what's really cool is um, I think a lot of us, at least I thought this before I I joined Maxar. I used to think that satellites just pointed straight down and you know took a bunch of pictures, but but. With our satellites, they're actually very agile. We have control moment gyros on the satellites that, that can actually point them in different directions. So in this case, we're taking a, a angled shot at the Andes Mountains. So we can see the side of things is the point. We're not always top down. Um, and that's gonna become really important as I pass this presentation over to Chris. Uh, if we can take pictures at various angles of anywhere on the earth, this allows us to reconstruct a, a 3D model um, using stereo photography. Um, we can actually build a 3D model, which is what we're doing. So for the last 20 plus years, we've been collecting two dimensional high resolution satellite imagery. We are now in the process of converting that entire archive into a three dimensional mirror world of planet Earth um, that could, that is going is being used by um, the media and entertainment industries is being used by video game developers um, and a lot of exciting other use cases. Um, so if you didn't recognize these cities, that's uh, New York and San Francisco. Um, and we have hundreds more of these available. Um, our Instagram page is, is actually a really good, good thing to follow because of all these visual examples. So um, at this point, um, Chris, who uh, was, I think he was able to join, he had a little difficulty getting in through the uh, the onboarding process, but uh, Chris, I believe you're online and you can- Yep, can you away. hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so I'll go through a couple different slides. So as Kevin was saying, you know, we, co we collect imagery, uh, all this imagery from space. Um, I guess I don't know who has the control of it, if somebody could go to the next one. Um, so it starts with all that imagery. Uh, we can click through these pretty quick and then we convert a lot of we're taking a lot of these different collections from all these different angles and, and through parallax just like the human eyes uh, we're creating 3d objects uh, of the earth of both the terrain and objects on top of those uh, in 3d uh, and what we can really do with this is is really you know, simulate and recreate you know earth and all the things on top of it in three dimensions uh, and and create those in formats like USD um, that make them really usable by uh, people like you, uh, um, but a whole host of different industries. And we can click through the next one. Um, so there's two really main types of 3D data that we create. We create uh, meshes uh, or a, like a type of raster data that that really is is great for um, large uh, terrain and uh, um, backgrounds and, and landscapes. Uh, and then vectors, so creating buildings themselves into uh, 3D objects that you can manipulate or modify or add, delete to. Um, and then, you know, both of these, creating these in a USD format is really important for us for our 3D work. We can click through the next one. And this is an example of what that looks like in Unreal. Um, so this is uh, a mesh. Uh, so this is, you know, the whole landscape is, is combined into a, a, a triangulated network um, that's re uh, represented here in a mesh format. Um, so we're viewing this in Unreal Engine. We can click through the next one. And then this is actually uh, USD data in Omniverse. And these are those 3D objects themselves. So we've actually um, not showing any textures on those. So you can think about this as almost like a blank canvas when it comes to any kind of building. I can move, manipulate, add to it, 
I can put my own textures on it. There's textures in the library that I can actually um, apply to any of those objects themselves um, to make it look, you know, realistic. Ah, here we go. Perfect. Make it more like geospecific, which is more realistic to what the actual thing looks like in real life. Um, or geotypical, which is uh, one of the things that we do for large scale areas um, to create, you know, recreating la large amounts of buildings. Um, we might do like a geotypical area where we're taking the actual dimensions of the building and creating a, you know, typical landscape, both texture and, and representation of the building versus something that might be more specific. <clears throat> we'll click through the next one. And so there's been several different uh, games actually that our, our data is in. Um, both in 2D and 3D, uh, and how these games actually uh, take some of this. A uh, really popular use case actually for a lot of our data is to take real world uh, imagery or 3D data and then create a fictional landscape actually out of this type of information. So this is a, one of my favorite examples, the most mm -hmm. recent Forza Horizon uh, game. It's set in Mexico. Um, the uh, Microsoft uh, Xbox team actually used um real imagery uh to create this landscape but it's a fiction it's a purely fictional landscape um mostly because no gamer wants to spend uh years uh driving just across mexico they want to spend two minutes at most going from place to place but it it hits on all those different uh real world landmarks that are important to the game uh and and I, it's a really cool representation of real world data into a fictional landscape um, a lot of this data, both 3D and then also 2D, uh, is also used in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Um, you'll see a lot of the two-dimensional data as you fly over uh, large landscapes at a high altitude is going to be um, a lot of our two-dimensional imagery. And then um, with our partnership with Black Shark, um, the cities are represented in those 3D objects that I was showing in Omniverse. It's those same types of things, just with texture applied to them, being used in this game itself. And so, you know, with these types of uh, data sets, processing this as USD, you know, Maxar is really trying to build, a, you know, Earth's digital twin um, that you can use uh, in USD format. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Jennifer, who has a lot more experience actually experimenting with some of this in USD format and a whole host of different uh, types of software. Hey. Okay, so um, just to, to uh, recap, the, the two data types that it sort of in within Maxar terms are precision 3D and sim 3D. And so those are the, so the kinds of um, data types that are associated with both of those. Um, so I, I full disclosure, I'm, I'm newer to Maxar and I, I come here from graduate school. I'd learn certain software like Houdini or Unreal Engine. So I tried experimenting with it at first. So if you go to the next slide, um, so first I put our New Orleans uh, Black Shark data into Unreal Engine, um, added some, some fun volumetric lighting to make it look more dramatic, but um, you can see you can get the full, uh, I don't know if the screen share is doing it justice, but the full um, 3D scene of, uh, of New Orleans there. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, here's it in the daylight. Um, and you can imagine how much less time it would take to, instead of having to build your own city, um, you know, you, you can just kind of, you get it right there um, using this, this Black Shark integration with our data. Um, so if you go to the next slide, so um, I had learned Houdini in graduate school, um, and I know that that's sort of a, a standard software for, for animation and VFX studios. Um, so added our, our data in there, and as it turned out, um, it, it looks much better than this, this GIF, which is now, uh, I'm sure the data quality is a little bit not as perfect as it is on screen, but um, but the data worked in USD format. Um, and so um, if you go to the next slide there, um, so I thought, okay, well, can you use our geospatial data? We've already been integrating into gaming um, related use cases. Can we integrate into some of the more visual effects film oriented um, use cases? So um, I, I used Cinema 4D, I tried to import you know, DEM data into it and it worked. Uh, 3ds max if you import geotiff data into it 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 worked so a lot of these geospatial data types actually did in fact work within the software that's used by major studios in in their everyday developer workflows um if you go to the next slide um even more simple um just putting geospatial data into blender um, which i'm sure a lot of the folks in this group uh use quite often uh and just seeing how simply our data uh, can be processed and, and work within these these new software environments that we've never really tried. We're a space company, so it's uh, it's very new for us. Um, 
So next slide. Um, so um, I I had you know reached out to to a friend of mine who's a graphics engineer at, at Pixar, and he said, um, you know, there actually are use cases for um, using geospatial data, not ours yet, <laughs> um, for you know for different uh, films. So the Good Dinosaur is a good example. Um, I'm there. There may be folks on this call who actually did work on this film, so I don't want to. I don't want to bore you with your own work, but um, it, in this use case, they used um, USGS data, which is a public open source data, which is not as high quality as ours, um, you know, to create this, uh, this landscape of Wyoming that's really visually beautiful. Um, and uh, and uh, you go to the next slide. Um, so here's just an example of what our data looks like as compared to a more standard public data source. Um, it's very high quality. Um, and as we sort of look at different interesting partnerships um, within the entertainment space, uh, we'd love to kind of explore how our data um, can be used. Um, so if you go to the next slide. Um, so here's a couple of, um, and while our data can also be used within VFX and film. Here are a couple of examples. Um, the Good Dinosaurs, Utopia, Ratatouille, Cars 2, Big Hero 6. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, in Ratatouille, they used um, 3D geospatial data of, uh, uh, of Paris uh, and, and asset models that were spatially accurate to the city of Paris, which I found fascinating. Uh, in Big Hero 6, they used 3D terrain from um, San Francisco and then asset models from Tokyo uh, to create the city of San Francisco uh, in Big Hero 6. Um, and um, I, I would imagine, and I'm sure that there are folks on this call who may have worked on these titles and how much that speeds things up instead of having to model individual um, individual models. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, Cars 2, another example, um, they used, um, uh, th this data in particular struck me because it looks so similar to the data that we already have for the Grand Canyon, for example, um, which for us took very little time to create. Um, but I know that from, that there's a, a fascinating New York Times article about how long it took to create um, some of the scenes in Cars 2. Um, and uh, and that that was chiefly because of the texturing of the rocks in Radiator Springs. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, so like look at a, a, a film like uh, Cars 2, right? Um, there's a this in this New York Times article. It talks about um, why some of the delays in production. I'm not trying to call anyone out, but you know, in, in some of the delays in reject production were some since in some regard. Um, because of rendering, but also because of some of the texturing. Um, and so I tried putting, you know, our, the Grand Canyon into uh, with, you know, with our data into um, into Unreal Engine, and it just, it, it, I mean, that I timed it. It took four minutes, uh, and you know, it's it's a more of a drag and drop than it is a creation. Um, so if this could speed up workflows, it uh, it would be great if we could we could potentially collaborate. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so just another sense of how detailed and beautiful the texturing is when you get down to uh, a really granular level uh, of what our data looks like. Um, it's it's really just beautiful. And um, I think that also presents a, a, another reason why it's better to use our data as compared to some of the some of the public data sources and use what Mother Nature gave us and uh, save developer time. Yeah. Um, so it seems like there's, as I'm, I've been exploring this avenue, uh, obviously we've been partnering with gaming companies, but studios and, and entertainment are, are still somewhat new. Um, it seems like there's two, uh, there's two ways to go about this. First with, is within 3D terrain and texturing. Um, on the far right, you'll see um, it's the, the sort of the Grand Canyon-like um, model that was in Blender. Um, and then on the left, you'll see um, some of our 2D imagery. It seems like from my conversation with um, uh, the friend at Pixar, they were also using um, 2D data to UV wrap 3D models. So even just our core bread and butter, our 2D imagery could also be used um, to help supplement workflows uh, and, and help developers who are, who are working within these fields. Uh, so to wrap it up, um, we have this uh, you know, 25 year archive of, of imagery. And as we're moving into 3D, um, our, our work has started to feel more like art than it is, um, than it is science. And it's, it would be wonderful to start collaborating with folks within the entertainment space who I think could find tremendous use uh, of our data. Um, we, uh, 
got permission to share a, a, a sample data set, which I'll also share a link in the chat. Um, if you want to, uh, you want to take a picture of that QR, I can send a link in the chat. Um, we'd love for you to play around with our data, see what your teams can do from a developer perspective. Um, and this, if, if there's anything to take away from this presentation, um, we'd love to chat with the folks who are in this group. Um, a lot of the people on this call are leaders in their own field within animation, visual effects, uh, film, especially on the, the technical side. And we'd love to sit down with you and just you know, see if you make use of our data. We're not we're not trying to sell anything. We just honestly want to see if you're if you could find our data of use. Um, and if you have you have time to chat.